episode two of Mirror, Mist, and Moonlight. Codex Entry 2 You've chosen to become an observer to a world in which certain rules apply. Rules that guide the outcome of a narrative. One such rule we will bear witness to, along with the travelers, is that of attraction. Attraction, at its most simplistic form, is a wavelength, a frequency. When two frequencies resonate similarly and are in close proximity to one another, they will either merge or find harmony. If these frequencies are not a match, they will repulse to varying degrees. The law of attraction applies to everything, from conscious beings down to the simplest of inanimate objects. Heavy clouds loomed over a patch of sea where no ship dare venture. It is a place where vessels lose their bearing and vanish. No wreckage or distress calls ever find their way out. Space was thin here. The membrane which gave structure to the world's physical materials had weakened. Hues of red and pink bled from the air above the ocean water. The perforated air leaked vapors slowly at first, but then grew in time until pressure from the opposing side tore its delicate skin. Plumes of mist poured out and coated the surface of the water. It was then that a force beyond the laws of nature manifested. A dark, porch-bearing obscurity emerged from the mist. A long canoe carried him through the breach and settled upon the waters. His torch fire burned furiously as the flames licked the open air. The fire spun upward and began to arch to the west. Kneeling down, he placed his free hand in the water at the side of the boat. The entity made an outwards ripple in the direction the flame revealed. Find the zodiacs as you expunge this world. The mist surrounding the boat sunk down into the sea and began to accelerate westward, dragging a swell of water behind it. Part 1. The Parchment and the Ring Moonlight is the key. The Keeper has forgotten of the mist set free. The voice from the dark corner reverberated in Klaus's mind as he stood dumbstruck, looking at the mirror resting against the wall across the room. Snickers could sense Klaus's alarm. What? What is it? Do you see something back there? His voice landed on deaf ears as Klaus cautiously advanced across the room. Just like in the vision, a single crack in the reflection split the room into twin images. High above them, the attic's only window cast a cold beam of light across the room, landing at the foot of the mirror. It reminded Snickers of the sunbeam that would visit him on the couch, but this was the sun's inverse luminous counterpart. Cautiously, they approached the face of the mirror. Snickers stayed a few steps behind the mouse, as if to use him for protection. The cat was confronted by unsettling familiarity the more time he spent in there. He felt close to something that has been long out of reach. Both animals could sense something unusual surrounding them. It wasn't just because the air throughout the attic was damp and thick, making it hard to breathe. Klaus stood at the edge of the darkness, somehow knowing that if he stepped into the light, his world could change indefinitely. There was no rose-colored glow coming from the reflection of the chest by the bed. Klaus deepened his gaze. He could see something through the hairline fracture, something on the other side of the crack that didn't belong. Shifting his head from side to side seemed to reveal a three-dimensional space, like looking through the gaps in a fence. Is it just me, or does it look like there's another room through the crack? They took a quick glance behind the mirror to be sure it wasn't leaning against a dimly lit crawl space. All they found was the flat wooden panel that the mirror rest upon. I don't understand. 
What am I looking at here? It's like there's another place. A dark place. Yeah. I know. I'm curious, too. Where the split glass met the wooden frame, a small metallic glimmer could be seen. The obstruction appeared to be caught between the two shards. It could have been easily overlooked had they not been so close. What is it? Snickers inquired. A sudden urge to glance backward drew Snickers' attention from the mirror over to the foot of the bed. It felt as though something was calling to him. He tried to hold on to the fleeting notion of importance, but it had vanished like smoke in the air. Klaus scurried up the side of the frame using the etched markings or footing. It's some kind of shiny metal. I think I can pry it out with my sword. The word sword had already left the mouse's mouth by the time he realized what he'd just done. Snickers focused his attention back to the mirror and leaned in to examine the seam with the metallic item in question. Okay then, let's see what it is. Would you like to do the honors? There it was. Klaus's mind searched for another way to move forward. He'd backed himself into a corner and now was faced with the task of having to explain why he has a sword that burns blue, and that's how he got through the window. He also knew that once he explained that, he'd have to answer more questions about its mysterious power, to which he had no response. The mouse had only just learned of its ability and hadn't even had a moment to examine it after the window incident, that he wondered why he didn't marvel at it then. It must have been due to the urgency of the circumstance. <sighs> Snickers, Klaus said after taking a deep breath. I can use my sword, but there's something you should know. I'm going to sound a bit crazy. He thought he'd try and explain it first before removing moonlight from its sheath, as to not alarm the cat. Another deep breath. Here it goes. There wasn't a hole in the window when I first jumped up on the windowsill. I knew it! It's my sword. When I got up there and saw you fall backwards and get caught up on the side of the stand, I had intended to use Moonlight, that's the name of the saber, to try and pry open the latch. I pulled it from the sheath, and this happened. Klaus drew the blade, freeing it from its home aside his hip. The blade cleared the sheath, giving off a dull reflection of the two animals looking down at it. I'm not sure what's going on here. Am I supposed to be seeing something other than your sword? Klaus waved the blade around before putting it back at his side and trying again, only to yield the same effect as before. Nothing. Okay. That's not what I expected. When I had it out at the window, I could have sworn that it caught fire and melted the glass. Klaus had begun to second-guess his recollection of the two's chance meeting. Maybe he'd been kicked harder than he realized, and it caused him to see things. Or maybe not. You okay? asked the cat with a concerned look. Yeah, uh, sorry. Maybe it was the lightning that I saw. The mouse knew that's not what he saw, but couldn't explain it any other way at the moment. The crimson one gently placed the tip of the blade just above the metal object in the crack of the mirror. Upon making contact with the glass, the reflection they saw before them liquefied. A ripple proliferated out towards the edges of the frame. Simultaneously, they looked at each other in disbelief, then returned their attention to the mirror. I didn't know it could do that, Snickers said, as he moved closer to the image of the cat staring back at him. Klaus worked the blade against the side of the chunk of metal, loosening it from its location. It's really in there. I don't know how much further I can move it. Let me give it a try said the cat as he extended his claws. Klaus hopped back down to the floor, giving the cat ample room to work. Snickers placed a claw against the object and slid it out of the mirror with ease, sending it tumbling to the floor. The mirror's reflection liquefied again, spilling reflective matter into the crack in the glass. Then the mirror settled again. The crack had disappeared. It had returned to a pristine single reflective surface. I don't know how it did that either. This was Snickers' attempt at keeping cool as the paradigm of his reality fell apart. A loud hammering 
snapped the two out of their infatuated state. The light that had been streaming down from the window high above had been blocked. It's that owl again, Klaus cried. I ran past him as I made my way to your house. He was there, standing guard. What, you mean the statue out front? No, sir. That thing's been there motionless for as long as I can remit. Snickers was cut off by the animal at the window slamming against the glass. Lightning cracked outside and illuminated the outline of the enormous owl, confirming Klaus's suspicion. The owl was staring down at them with a look that made their blood run cold. Flashes of light struck again, backlighting the figure, but this time it was not the owl. It was a human's disembodied head. Jay? Snickers said, straining to get a better look. Two flashes of light, only seconds apart, first revealed the face of the human to him known as Jay. A second burst of light returned the shape to that of an owl. The winged beast pecked at the glass furiously, sending cracks in all directions. He's going to get through, Klaus said. Frantically, they looked around the room for protection in preparation for the creature's unwelcome entrance. At the edge of the cat's peripheral view, he caught a glimpse of the small, shiny object by his paw. It was a gold coin with markings on its face. Klaus thought of the vision he'd had, thinking that they needed immediate protection or a good place to hide. Also, he didn't want to leave there without investigating the chest. Get to that box by the bed. Go! The owl stopped as if he'd heard Klaus's statement. They watched the menacing owl's nocturnal eyes follow them, as they made their way to the chest, but halfway across the room the owl disengaged from the window and flew away. Klaus and Snickers breathed the premature sigh of relief. Seconds later, they heard the front door slam open, followed by heavy, rapid footsteps. It's Jay! We need to leave, now, Snickers said. I can't. Not yet, Klaus replied. What do you mean? He's coming for us. I need to see what's in that chest, Snickers. I can't explain. I'm sorry. Go if you need to. I'll be fine. The mouse darted towards the foot of the bed, making his way up the side of the old mattress and onto the top of the box. The lid was closed. Come on, do your thing, Klaus frantically exclaimed as he pulled moonlight from its sheath. He went to work carving at the top of the box, but soon realized that it would take an eternity without the blade's blue flame. I can't wait any longer. I can hear him downstairs. He's in the kitchen. Snickers. Oh, Snickers. Here, kitty, kitty. Come and see what I've brought you and your little friend. A voice taunted from the bottom of the stairway. Jay had blocked the only exit from the attic. Again, Snickers looked back at the coin laying on the ground. Klaus, we've got to make a run for it. It's now or never. He grabbed the coin expecting to try and dart past the malicious man walking up the stairs. When his paw met the glistening cold surface of the metal, he was struck with a notion. The coin was the object he so often grasped for during the episodes of Phantom Pains, not the remote control. It bloomed brilliant blue light in Snickers' paw. As the light filled the room, it set off tremors upon every surface. The walls, ceiling, and door frame began to age and then decay, right before them, as if time had sped up. The paint on the walls, boards below their feet, and roof all began to waste and tear away. No! Jay exclaimed as he reached the landing just outside the room. The floor at the base of the attic door collapsed, just as Jay pushed it open enough to look Snickers in the eyes before plummeting downward in a pile of debris. Vapor began to coalesce around all of the decrepit material the house had just shed. The vapor thickened around the fallen debris and then consumed it, turning the matter into a mist which swirled around them. Klaus, bearing witness to all of this, had managed to not be hit by any of the falling objects. The mist peeled away the dull, reflective facade surrounding his saber. Moonlight's blue flame raged, just like he'd expected to see at the mirror. Klaus! Snickers! Are you okay? They said at the same time. Snickers wanted to say jinx, but refrained. What the hell just happened? Asked the cat, rhetorically. Your sword! It's on fire! That's what I was trying to show you earlier. This is how I got through the window. 
It's how I'm going to get into this chest. He drew a circle around him with the fiery blade and fell through into the dark cavern of the box. You okay down there? A voice bellowed from above. All things considered, yeah, just peachy. He took a few moments to look around the dark, musky chest. His illuminated sword radiated deep blue and purple. It made for a perfect torch. An old quilted blanket, pair of men's boots, some books, and... What's that? Klaus spotted something in the corner which looked like a silver napkin holder wrapped around an old parchment. Did you see it, Klaus? What that coin did from the mirror when I touched it? It's still glowing a bit now, but it's not hot. I can't believe my eyes. All that debris from the house falling apart, it seems to have turned into a mist, which is now gathered above us, by the ceiling. Snickers felt the need to describe the anomaly as Klaus dug around in the box. It helped ease his nerves. Do you hear that man Jay making any noise from where the floor fell in? inquired the crimson one. Nothing right now, but we should try and hurry and get out of here. Snickers realized as he spoke of leaving that there was nowhere else for him to leave to. Klaus examined the silver ring. It was inscribed with three markings set in a row wrapped around the circumference. The first one looked like an uppercase T with a circle atop. Then there was a circular indentation in the center followed by a final marking which looked like a flower. The parchment and the ring were too big for Klaus to carry, let alone scale back up to the hole at the top with. I found something. Step away from the box for a sec. Snickers took several generous steps backward, thinking at this point in the night anything could happen. He watched the bottom corner of the box as Klaus sliced a smoking door out of its side. Give me a hand, Snicks. Snickers reached into the mouse hole and retrieved the item Klaus had been examining. Klaus pulled the parchment from the ring and began to unroll it, but stopped when he saw that the coin in Snickers' paw was glowing a deep purple from the grooved markings it had on its face. It looks just like the color of the flame that burns off of moonlight. They both held up their glowing objects to compare. It really does. They've got to be related. It's a pretty big coincidence, if not. Klaus looked down at the ring, which was on the floor between them, realizing that the indentation on its side was just about the same diameter as the coin in the cat's paw. I have an idea, Snix. See if that coin will fit in the center here, he said, pointing out the circular indentation. Uh, are you sure that's a good idea? Haven't we done enough? Just this last thing. And then we'll jet, I promise. Snickers didn't know Klaus very well, but considering what they had just been through, he was beginning to trust the little guy. The cat picked up the ring and instinctively affixed it to his front leg. Then he took the coin and joined it to the center of the ring. The two items had a magnetism to each other. It was a perfect fit. The cloud of mist at the ceiling which was now circling, began to move downward towards the cat. I knew we should have just left when we had the chance, Snickers said as he danced around the room trying to avoid the mist. Like a tornado in reverse, the vaporous matter targeted the ring and inlaid coin. It made contact and penetrated the coin's surface. In a swirling flash, the entire cloud was drawn into the ring around Snickers' leg. The room was quiet, save for the distant thunderclaps and light drizzle of rain pattering on the wooden floor through the freshly made skylights. Klaus grabbed the parchment and folded it over on itself several times more than he'd anticipated it could. It was now small enough for him to fit in his messenger bag. Okay, Snix, lead the way. They carefully made their way across several precarious boards of the landing where Jay had fallen. Looking into the depths of the sinkhole gave them no insight as to if the man was still down there. They made their way down what was left of the stairs and into the kitchen. The cat didn't even recognize his own home anymore. All of the modern features were gone. They had to pass through the living room to reach the front door. To the cat's surprise, his TV had turned back into that small boxy tube set that was there before the kitchen fire. 
His nest on the sofa was gone, too. In its place was a chair with shredded mildewy upholstery. Nothing for me here now, he said as he walked out the front door with his new companion. They reached the gate at the end of the walkway and looked up at the podium where the owl statue had once been. This whole time, Jay was... Snickers trailed off. My whole life was a facade. Part 2. Paper Genie Dawn was breaking, and the storm had dwindled enough to see the starlight in the expanse of the raw ether. The two didn't speak much of the incident at the cottage as they walked towards the harbor. Do you have anywhere to go? No. I mean, I don't know. I've been at that place for a while, but I know I wasn't always there. It's just a haze before that. Come with me, on the ship. You'll at least have shelter and food. Food? The cat's ears perked up joyously for the first time since he sat in front of the window about to savor his Mr. Mittens. There's cheese. Lots of cheese. That's always a sure bet, but the cargo changes frequently, so we get... I get other stuff, too. We? Were you traveling with others? Just one, Uncle Basil. I called him that, but I'm not really related to him. We got separated a few months back. I'm sorry, Klaus. Is he okay? I wish I could answer that, but I really don't know what happened. One moment we were together at a circus. Something spooked the entertainers, and an elephant ended up trampling the stands we were in. I got out and waited for Basil, but he never came out. I thought maybe he'd gone back to the Noki looking for me, so I returned. The ship left port without him. Maybe I should have stayed there to look for him. Klaus held a quiet contemplation for several minutes before breaking the silence. Look! There she is. The nautical Noki. Both Klaus and Snickers took a sigh of relief, knowing that their ordeal had come to an end. They made their way through the parking area with the bump that had sent the mouse's bag tumbling to the floor, and over to the awning that Klaus and the crewmen took shelter in the night prior. Once the mouse stepped onto the dock, exhaustion and hunger swept over him. All he wanted to do was curl up in his bed in the barrel. Snickers was shaken in the face of new beginnings. He'd never been outside before today. It's beautiful, Klaus. Is it? I'm glad you think so, Snix. They made their way up the cargo ramp. About halfway up, Klaus heard Gunny cursing and complaining to presumably himself as he tossed boxes around. That goddamn storm causing more work for us. I oughta bill Mother Nature for an extra time I'm putting in. If that damn hatch weren't open, we'd be on our way. But now we gotta head on back, all over a stupid special delivery that needs to be mint. Some of these folks we do business with, man, I'll tell ya. And I'll be damned if Pops expects us to do all this out of the kindness of our hearts. Gunny continued to ramble on as Klaus and Snickers snuck by. Klaus led Snickers back to his barrel in the corner. The empty barrel had been stored there initially as a makeshift table for crewmen to play cards at while sipping on whatever grog they had on tap. But now it had become a graveyard for old tools and materials to grow rust on. Basil had renovated the inside when he first took Klaus under his wing. He constructed two rooms, a food bank, living room, and bath. There was a small hole at the base of the overturned barrel, which made for a nice entry. Cat and Mouse weren't there long before Shane stepped out of the mid-cabin and yelled over to Gunny. Wrap it up, brother. We're pulling anchor. Get to your post on deck. I'll have Kester come down and clean up the rest. We don't want to be here when Kester comes down, Snakes. Let's go topside until we push off. Topside? Okay. Snickers replied. He'd heard the term on one of his TV shows before. By the time the two reached the stern, the merchant vessel was already treading outward bound. Light was spilling over the horizon, casting the first sign of color to the world around. Snickers and Klaus hopped up on the lazarette at the aft of the stern. 
They watched the distance between them and Emerald Bay grow until the haze in the atmosphere blotted out the last recognizable shapes. The cat felt a sense of freedom he'd not known before as he inhaled the fresh salted breeze. Life at the house had felt like a dream to him now. They returned to the cargo bay once the cat's old life had faded out of sight. When Klaus heard boxes being tossed around down in the cargo bay, he knew it was Kester, and he was not in a good mood. Was he ever really? Lay low, Snicks. We don't want to run into that one. Snickers was not about to argue. They found their way over to the barrel, and Klaus ran in, dropping off his bag and sword. He re-emerged, holding the parchment that folded more times than it should have. What do you think it is? Your guess is as good as mine, but I'm willing to bet that it has something to do with what you have around your leg. The Snickers had forgotten about the ring and coin. It felt natural against his fur, and the weight of the thing was somehow comforting. Klaus began to unfold the paper. It was blank. Just an old piece of writing material. Snickers placed a paw on the center of the parchment as if he were pressing on a button. Tight coils of blue mist seeped out of the fibers and organized themselves in recognizable symbols. It had manifested a letter. At the top, it read, The Codex. My dear travelers, I'm writing to you out of time and place. This paper will serve as a guide during moments of peril and obscurities. You have procured a wealth of knowledge to which I have spent much time documenting here in these annals. If you've acquired this through means of good intent, then it shall serve you well. Beware that all inquiries posed will have an effect on the reality you currently occupy. Use the Codex to restore balance. Using it for self-gain would be unwise. With that said, you may now place your first inquiry. First the sword, then the mirror liquefying, and the coin doing whatever to that mist from the house, and Jay being the statue of an owl, to this, the codex. I can only imagine what's next. Snickers thought that he might wake up at any moment back in his nest, and this reality would just fade away to wherever dreams go. Okay, I have a question for you, Paper Genie. That's what you are, right? Snicks, wait! It's said that our questions can have an effect on our reality, and should only be used for... Klaus trailed off as they both watched the paper blue mist coils rearrange and settle into a new formation. I am we, and we have gone by many names. We were the observer before becoming the first traveler. Okay, thank you, Klaus said, folding the paper back up until it was again small enough to stuff in his bag. What are you doing, Klaus? Shouldn't we ask it stuff? I have a million questions. I do too, Snicks, but we should be careful with this. And with that, he said, pointing to the ring on Snickers' leg. And your sword too, I'm guessing. Yes, I suppose you're right, Snicks, and Moonlight. Let's just let things cool off a bit before we go stirring anything else up. I'm exhausted, and we have a day or even two before we get back to Pebble Beach, depending on the wind and all. I'm assuming that's where Gunny was referring to when we boarded the ship. I hope it is, because I may know someone there who has answers to some of the questions without having to resort to, what did you call it, the paper genie? Klaus directed Snickers on where to find a payload of cheese. He tore at a bit of plastic wrap, pulling it away from a box holding a pallet's worth of cheese wheels, took one wheel in his mouth and brought it back to the entrance of the barrel. They shared a quiet meal, filling their bellies until they felt like they'd burst and then fell into a deep sleep. Snickers dreamt of a marble palace. There were statues of cats ranging from lions and tigers to small domestic ones. Outside, there was a fountain shaped like a flower. It was modeled after the white lily pad blooms on the shore of a long river. They awoke to the sound of the cargo ramp being lowered and the crewman's sarcastic banter. Pebble Beach, take two. Part three, harmless as a mouse. The cargo bay door lowered to meet the docks, letting light from the new day flood the hold. 
Snickers looked towards the opening, but all he could see was white flower-shaped light for a few moments until his eyes adjusted. The morning was already several hours past dawn. Klaus made his way out of the barrel, rubbing his eyes. He joined Snickers in the blinding view, stretching as he walked. A yawn accompanied by a short, vigorous, full-furred tremor completed his waking ritual. Klaus the Crimson was relieved to be at the familiar docks of Pebble Beach. We shouldn't be here long. They're letting us swap out the old merch for new ones. I guess they say some of it may still be salvageable or something. So they want the damaged ones back. Don't dilly-dally, boys. The old man's already steamed as it is. We'll push off just past lunch, if everything goes according. That should be just enough time to stop by Apollo's for a quick drop-in. He's the one who made Moonlight. He might know more than he told me before, Klaus said eagerly. He popped in and out of the barrel to grab the sword and bag so quick that if Snickers had blinked, he'd have thought the items appeared out of thin air. Let's go! It wasn't a far trek to the badger's hut under the bushes in the alley, but there was quite a lot of foot traffic to duck and dodge at this time of day. They weaved around careless and inconsiderate shoes and other obstacles out on the sidewalk until they reached the head of the alleyway. Snickers was overwhelmed with new sights and smells from the commercial district. On one paw, he knew that what they were doing was important, but on the other, he just wanted to explore and enjoy the world he just stepped into. There will be plenty of time later, he reasoned with himself. They walked down to the end of the alley and knocked on the hut's door. Zora opened it first staring at the giant cat with an alarmed look, then realizing he was in familiar company. Klaus, didn't you leave on the Noki but two days ago? What happened? Short story, some of the cargo on board was damaged during the storm. We came back so the crew could get new merchandise. Long story, well, that's a bit more complicated, and that's why we're here now. Zora meet Snickers. Snickers, this is Zora. I met Snicks in Emerald Bay. That's where we had to seek emergency docking due to the storm. I'll explain it all to both of you. Oh, well, Apollo's with the girls in the park. A little father-daughter time. I hate to interrupt, but this matter is time-sensitive, as the ship won't be here for long. They want to push off just after lunch. Could you point us in their direction? Actually, if you just take the back trail around the plants outside, you'll find a narrow path that leads right up the hill to the park. Shouldn't be hard at all. Thank you, Zora. We'll be back shortly, and then I'll explain everything. Snickers and Klaus left the hut and turned to the trailhead just behind the house, where the small dirt pathway led up the hill. The air was fresh and crisp, the way it gets in the morning when dewdrops decorate the forest and birds begin to sing their first song of the day. It was serene. Klaus spotted Apollo from a distance, and for a while refrained from approaching. He watched how much joy being with his children brought him as he chased them back and forth. They laughed as they rolled around in the grass and tossed acorns at each other. Astra and Asha teamed up on their dad, climbing either side of him and covering his eyes. They rocked back and forth until he lost his footing and tumbled downward to the ground. Thankfully, the girls landed on his head for a bit of cushion to soften the fall. When they finally let him up, Apollo opened his eyes to an unexpected sight. Klaus, is that you? Hey, buddy, I'm back. Can I have a word? Of course you can. Are you okay? Is this cat giving you problems? Because if he is, you know, no, no, nothing like that. This is Snickers. I met him in Emerald Bay after an emergency docking situation, courtesy of that terrible storm but I'll get to all that later. I feel bad for asking you for your time. I see how much you all are enjoying this. It's okay, Klaus. Your family, too. Klaus stopped momentarily, choking on a bit of sentiment. He didn't know what to say except thank you. That means a great deal. Back at the Badger's hut, Klaus sat Apollo and Zora down to catch them up to speed on the recent events, while Snickers kept the girls entertained by attempting to pick things up with his hooked tail tip. The badgers looked at Klaus and then over at the cat. Is he right in the head? I mean, he's a bit awkward, but nice. Yeah, he's as harmless as a, well, me. 
He's just getting a feel for being around other animals. I found him in a creepy old house that was guarded by an owl. I don't think he's ever been outside until we escaped. Klaus went on to explain to the badgers that he'd save Snickers with the help of Moonlight. He told them about the mirror and the shape-shifting man-owl, and the mist. He saved the codex for last. Wow, Klaus. That's kinda... unbelievable. Are you sure you weren't just hallucinating due to exhaustion, or maybe it was weather-related? Snickers, come on over and show them the thing you did with the paper back on the boat. I think you're gonna like this trick. It's much better than the tail hook, I promise. Klaus pulled out the codex from his bag and unfolded it into its original oversized shape. I'm already intrigued, Apollo said, retrieving a magnifying glass from the stand next to him. It's not paper or cloth. It doesn't seem to be pressed or sewn. Looks like it was grown. See the concentric lines? Klaus placed it on the table with a knot that looked like a face. Okay, Snicks, you're up. Snickers went to place his paw on the codex, but retracted his paw just before making contact. Wait, remember what it said before, Klaus? All questions should be of good intent, and that they can have effect on reality, I think it was? Right, yes, of course. Good catch. So what should we ask it? What do you want to ask it, Snickers? The cat thought for a moment and then said, I want to know why everything in my house changed and why I don't recall how long I was there. His paw pressed into the paper, activating the misty blue ink coils. This time the codex read, By now, you've surely encountered what I affectionately call the mist. It's been referred to by many different names throughout the ages. Ether, magic, force, mana, and more. Its origin stems from a place between all other places called the Void. The Void is a topic we will circle back to later in greater detail. The mist holds no bias. It does not tend towards the common understanding of good or evil, just as a rock or tree has no motivation to sway the balance of light and dark. The mist is the medium which makes up all realities. It settles into objects, space, life forms, thoughts, and emotions as it spreads across the canvas of time. Life forms that existed long before you learned how to control the mist. They created powerful objects with the ability to manipulate it to their will and called them the Zodiac Pendants. Surely you possess one of these pendants, as this is how the Codex is activated. In some cases, pendants can be used to return the mist to the void, among other things. There are some who seek control by means of the mist's power. They may use it to cloak reality, or to draw out malicious entities to which they intend to command. Mist that enters a world post-creation of its reality must be returned to the void, for it will eventually begin to affect the stability of said dimension. So it's true then. Everything you've said, and Moonlight too? It really glows with blue flame? Apollo marveled. Indeed it does. Zora placed her paw against the ring with the pendant fixed to Snicker's front leg. I know this coin. It's just like the one I got in trade from that old squirrel down at the market. She practically gave it to me. The one we had was much more weathered, not good for collecting. But the metal was useful, right, hun? Apollo looked at her, and then at Klaus, and then down at the saber at his side. Useful? Uh, yes, very useful, dear. As Klaus, Zora, and Apollo started to piece together what had happened with the coin and the sword, Snickers sat in silent contemplation. So it was the mist, then. It was throughout the entirety of the interior of the cottage. That's why it looked new, and the outside was so worn down. In reality, it was always worn down. That means that while I thought I was sitting on my couch enjoying my TV, I was really on that old nasty chair, looking at that ancient light box the whole time. And Jay, he must have never actually gone to work. He'd come in to make sure I was still oblivious to the fact that I was in a prison. 
I was totally duped. Why didn't I see it before? Snickers looked back at the codex, examining it for answers. How much time had actually passed while trapped in that place? A month? A year? More? Here, it says that it's not just objects, but thoughts and emotions too. Why can't I remember my life before the cottage now then? Is the mist still manipulating me somehow? Don't you agree, Snickers? Klaus said, snapping his friend out of his train of thought. I said we should go speak with her. Who exactly are we going to speak to? The cat said, joining the conversation again. Leto, the old squirrel that Zora got the pendant from, which was used to make moonlight? Snickers tried to play it off like he'd been listening the whole time. Oh yeah, her, of course. Well, if we expect to find any answers, we'd better head out. I'm guessing we have an hour and a half, two tops before the Noki pulls anchor. I don't think you'll find her at the market. It was unusual for her to be there. She's a recluse. The word on the street is that she lives out past the park in a meadow with a thicket of trees in the center. It's been called the island. There should be an old farmhouse at the center. I'll bet you find her there somewhere. Be weary, though. I expect she doesn't take kindly to trespassers. Maybe I should go with him, hun. Leto likely knows who I am and would be more willing to talk if I'm there with them. Yes, dear, that's a good idea. Take this necklace with you, Zora said, removing it from around her neck. As a trade for information if you need to. Are you sure, hun? I am, she said in reply as she handed it over to Apollo, folding his paw around it. Come back to me soon, Zora said gently, pressing her snout against his. Girls, I'll be back in a bit. Then we can go back to the park, but for now be good to your ma. Yes, papa. Klaus picked up the codex from off the table and returned it to his bag. Before Apollo opened the door, he grabbed a belt with pouches on either side and placed the necklace in one of them, for safekeeping. He slung the belt over a shoulder, like a sash. Then he turned back to Zora, Astra, and Asha, and blew a kiss before opening the door. The badger stepped out of the hut, followed by the mouse and cat. Part 4 The Fade The three critters made their way back up the hill to the park, and continued on past. At the end of the field was a wall of dense forest foliage. There was still a trail to follow, but it looked as though it hadn't seen much traffic. It wasn't long before they passed entirely through the greenery and were standing at the edge of a meadow, looking out at a thicket of trees, encompassing an old farm-style house. Let's get a move on. Daylight's a burnin'. I don't want to be responsible for you not making it back to the docks in time to catch your ride. The badger hastened his stride, and the others fell in behind him. The meadow's grass was tall and dry, and the sun, now directly overhead, beat down on them. But it wasn't long before they reached the cool relief of the island's shade. They were surprised to find a young squirrel waiting for them. She had a bow, an arrow quiver strapped to her back, and a face that read suspect all over. She examined them, taking a good long look and pacing back and forth a bit. Are you the traveler? masked one. She directed the question at Apollo. Who have you brought with you? I'm Snickers, the cat blurted out, unaware of the tension in the air. You, badger. Apollo, miss. I'm surprised we've not met before. The young squirrel's stoic posture and stone-cold face made her intentions unreadable. Apollo cleared his throat. We are looking for an old woman called Leto. Do you know her? Is she here? Again, the squirrel asked, Are you the traveler? No, I I'm a blacksmith. My friend here does all the traveling, Apollo said, pointing down at Klaus. So, if you know where we can find... Apollo was cut short by the squirrel. I won't ask again. Only the traveler may pass, she said as she whipped the bow off of her back and drew an arrow. Snickers felt an oddly familiar sensation of protection ignite within him as he leapt out in front of his two companions. He puffed his fur and ducked his head in an aggressive stance, 
locking eyes with the squirrel. It didn't take him but a moment to realize what he'd just done before he wanted to cower away. But he held his ground. The squirrel pulled back on the arrow as if she were about to release it with all of its fury, sending it speeding through the air between them and plunging it deep into the cat's chest. She'd intended to open fire right then, but as her clawed paw began to let loose on the string, she noticed a shining silver ring around the cat's front leg and quickly lowered her weapon. My apologies to you, Traveler. She bowed her head a bit to show respect to the cat. Snickers was confused. He looked back over his shoulder, making sure that she was actually addressing him. He was still uneasy about his decision to jump out in front of a drawn arrow, and he was only getting more confused. You possess the Lotus Gauntlet. You are the son of Bastet, are you not? Snickers looked at Klaus and shook his head as if to say, What in the actual hell is going on? Before any of them could respond, the girl barked in order. Follow me. They kept a bit of distance from her as she led them to an old tree just next to an adjoining garage of the old farmhouse. Soft music could be heard coming from the garage, along with some mechanical clanks and bangs from a car being worked on. The squirrel stopped at a hollow just at the base of the ancient tree. Its roots were gnarled and raised out of the ground, creating an entrance. She motioned for Snickers to enter. He took a long, deep breath in and said out loud, We've come this far. Then he ducked his head under the threshold of the entrance and walked in. Apollo and Klaus stepped forward, ready to follow, but the squirrel placed herself in their path. No, just him. The inside of the tree opened up into a surprisingly wide area. It reminded Snickers of a show he used to watch late at night called Dr. What. The doctor had a time machine that looked like a porta potty, but on the inside it was a massive spaceship. The cat made his way to the back of the cavern where he could see a flame from a candle on a small table. An elderly female squirrel sat at its side. You must be the new traveler which the pendant has chosen. Come closer. Let me have a look at you. As he moved into the light, he saw how frail the woman was. She examined him under the low light. Leto's eyes locked with the cat's. Her face went from curiosity to astonishment. Where have you been, old friend? I'm sorry, ma'am. But you must have me mistaken. Mijos. No. You may look different than before, but I'd know those eyes in any form you choose. Snickers didn't want to argue with an old lady who might be losing her faculties, so he just asked a question. Can you tell me about the pendant you traded with a badger at the market some time ago? You know of this? Leto replied. It's what brought us here to see you. My two friends outside are really the ones you should be talking to. So you didn't come to see me then, Mijos? You followed the others? I must speak with them then. The one who possesses the pendant needs guidance just like you did for me long ago. Don't you remember? I have to admit, my memory is not very good. It's kind of blank before the time I spent trapped in a house. I only discovered recently that something called mist was changing the way I saw things, and I know it must have gotten to my mind some way too, because I was nothing but complacent. I would have died there if it weren't for Klaus. He may be the one you want to talk to. You say you were trapped? Held prisoner? I didn't know it at the time, but the human I lived with was actually an owl. Or maybe it was the other way around. Damios. Did you put an end to him before you escaped? If I did, it wasn't intentional. He fell while in human form. I didn't see him again. If he got away, then surely he's made contact with Kronos. And if that's the case, he will be coming for you. Leto's voice called out from inside the hollow. Artemis, it's okay. Bring them to me now. The mouse and badger entered with the intimidating archer squirrel named Artemis. Leto introduced herself to the two new faces, as well as assuring them that Artemis meant well. One of you possesses the pendant, then? The one I traded? Apollo explained that his wife Zora had hoped to add it to her collection of rarities but decided it was too weathered of a collectible to be displayed. So then, 
Where is it now? asked Leto, with some reserve in her voice. It's here, kind of. It was still a unique material, so I decided to use it in one of my art pieces. Klaus stepped in, seeing that Apollo wasn't quite sure how to explain it without feeling guilty that he'd melted down the pendant. Have you heard the story of the Crimson Danger Mouse? Critters talk. Yes, I've heard rumor, she answered. It's hard to believe, I'm sure, but those stories are about me, although embellished a bit. Apollo swallowed a chuckle at that statement. My dear, talented friend Apollo here made the kindest gesture of selflessness that I have ever been afforded. Klaus loosened the knot in the red sash resting at his waist and slid moonlight out still in its sheath. This is where the pendant is now, mixed in to the very heart of the blade. Leto sat quietly for some time before breaking the silence in the room. The pendant found a blacksmith who went on to reshape its weathered form into something entirely new that would be willed by a small but revered living legend who would go on to save this cat's life and free him from a missed prison, uniting two pendants and then delivering them both back to me? I have to admit, this is more than I ever could have expected. Why did you get rid of it in the first place? asked the Crimson One. Look at me. I've had my adventures, and seen my share of unfathomable places. I'm too old to travel anymore. I tried giving it to Artemis, but it wouldn't work for her. Who knows how these things work? I like to think they abide by a form of fate, using us as pieces to move around like a game of chess. The only way to ever really be sure is if we had the Codex. It's a very powerful tool that has been used throughout time immemorial. Klaus, Snickers, and Apollo looked at each other contemplatively before Klaus turned to face Leto, drawing the parchment from his bag. Like this one? Both Leto and Artemis's eyes lit up. It's the first reaction they had seen from the young archer. It can't be! Just then, a bone-chilling rumble accompanied by distant cracking and grinding filled the air. Vibrations followed deep beneath their paws from within the earth. Assisting Leto from her chair, the critters swiftly made their way to the entrance of the hollow. A steady shifting in the ground made it hard to stand upright. Artemis and Apollo gripped either side of Leto, supporting her frail frame from losing balance. The radio that had been playing music in the garage had changed to the emergency broadcast sound, an offensive beeping that only ever fueled one's sense of panic. The ground settled for a moment. I have to get back home. They could hear the worry in Apollo's voice. The badger began to walk towards the meadow in the direction that they had come when the second wave of quakes hit. They could hear tsunami sirens wailing from Pebble Beach. No, no, no! Apollo tried to run, but the quaking was too violent for him to even stand. They all lay flat in the soil. The shaking went on for several minutes. By the time it stopped, Snickered had lost the contents of his stomach. An old man emerged from the garage he'd been tooling around in and stepped out into the field offset from the critters. Snickers watched him as he peered out in the direction of the sirens from town. This is bad. Really bad. I have to get back to my girls. Snickers turned his attention to Apollo momentarily before glancing back in the old man's direction. He'd disappeared. The badger took off running through the field at a full sprint, putting distance between him and the others. Klaus, Snickers, and Artemis followed swiftly behind. The archer stopped and looked back at Leto, who had stayed at the edge of the island. They could hear car alarms going off in the direction of the town. The trees at the edge of the meadow began to tremble and shake. A wayward wall of wind burst forth from the forested area, sending Apollo tumbling backward. They braced for impact as tree debris and dirt came flying their way. Leto called out to Artemis, The Fade! Get them to the Fade! Come with us, Mom, please! We'll help you! Leto smiled at her daughter and mouthed, It's time as she recessed into the hollow. Tears filled Artemis's eyes as she turned back towards the oncoming wind. 
the archer grounded her footing and retrieved the bow from her back. She held it out in front of her, facing into the wind, then reached back and drew an arrow quick and controlled. Artemis closed her eyes for a moment as she whispered something quietly. Just before the invisible wall struck the group, she opened her eyes, firing the arrow high and far. It left a trail of green light behind it as it cut through the wind, accelerating towards the tree line at the edge of the meadow. Klaus had drawn moonlight and sunk it into the ground, holding it as an anchor point. He had expected it to be thrown backwards like Apollo when the wind hit, but was surprised to see the sword once again bailing him out of a bad situation. The saber split the wind like a zipper around him and the other critters. He pulled it from the ground and advanced forward. Get to Apollo! Klaus shouted over the raging wind. Artemis pointed at the path her arrow took. We'll get him on the way! We need to head for that location. Apollo was still tumbling back in their direction as they quickened their pace. They were halfway through the field before they made contact with the badger. Snicks, grab him! He reached out a paw and hooked it under Apollo's leg, pulling him into the pocket of safety that Moonlight was carving out. Apollo had taken a beating. Both Snickers and Artemis helped him along as they followed Klaus's lead. Apollo raised his head and to his dismay was shocked to see something growing far off in the distance towards the ocean. He rubbed his eyes in disbelief. Guys, tell me I'm delusional, that I'm seeing things. He said, pointing at a swell of ocean water that seemed to curve up to the heavens. If it's still that far off and already that big, we're all done for, Apollo said, hanging his head back down. No, we're not. We just need to find where my arrow landed and we'll be out of its path. There was no use in turning tails outrun the tsunami, so the animals burst into a full sprint, giving it everything they had in order to make it to the trees before the wall of water descended upon them. They had seconds now before meeting their imminent demise. Klaus, come to me, Artemis ordered. Just there, between the two trees, do you see it? It's your arrow. Can you see what the arrow landed in? He looked hard, blinked, and then realized that there was a distortion in the space where the arrow lay. The light was bending around a circular area about the size of a basketball. Cut it open, now! Klaus jumped over to the anomaly and slashed at the air. The fabric of their reality tore open, exposing a rose-colored glow from beyond the slit. Artemis grabbed her arrow from the ground and then jumped into the tear, followed by Klaus and Apollo. Nope, no way. That's the craziest thing yet. Snickers put his face next to the opening just enough to test it with his whiskers before Apollo's front paw reached back out and pulled him through. It was silent inside the rose-tinted interior of whatever they were in other than the panting of the animals. Artemis sealed the opening by pressing the seams of the tear back together again. They could still see their surroundings in the woods, but it was like watching it through a foggy faded red filter. The tsunami consumed their location tearing up whole trees by their roots. Their view had become completely submerged in water a hundred feet overhead. Fragments of building material mixed with the occasional car blasted past them. A boat overhead cast a shadow down on them. Was that the Noki? Snickers asked. Klaus ignored the question. What is this place, Artemis? We call it the Fade. It's not really a place, though. It's a space between places, a membrane. The next layer below is the void, but there's no way to get there from here, not without a mirror. For a long time, nothing else was said as they watched the surrounding landscape be torn down. Apollo lay on the floor of the fade, holding his head with his paws. My girls, Astra, Asha, Zora, my dear sweet family. Come. We can move through the fade in the direction of your home. Artemis didn't know if that would be any consolation, but it was something for him to focus on. The water had done so much damage to everything, all they could really do was approximate where his home used to be. There's nothing left. No sign that we ever even existed. They sat down, huddled together, and waited for the water to recess. Hours went by before the flooding was low enough to reemerge. Artemis set up the bow and arrow again, whispering to it with her eyes closed. 
She released the arrow, but this time it didn't fly far. It landed on an apartment balcony on what was once the main strip. Only a partial wall of brick and a bit of cement held together with rebar remained. Up there, that's the closest way out. It's a thin point. You'll be able to cut us back out just like you did before, Klaus. Klaus drew moonlight and put it to use, tearing open the fabric of the fade. Blinding white light flooded in. Artemis stepped through, back into the world. Apollo followed eagerly, followed by Snickers and Klaus. They had expected to be standing on the second level of a building in the ruins of what was formerly known as Pebble Beach, but to their utter amazement, they were standing on a completely intact balcony situated on a completely intact building in a row of perfectly unaffected other buildings lining the commercial district. They could see down below that the shops were untouched, signs still hung in the storefronts with open doors, as if it was business as usual. The only detail that was out of place seemed to be the cars on the street. They were all abandoned, as if the drivers didn't bother to pull over and park before ditching their rides. They slid open the door to the adjoining room and entered. Nothing was even damp to the touch. It was all a vision then, Apollo had an optimistic tone. My house must still be there. No, I'm sorry, Apollo. It's not the same. Something's off. We must be cautious. The tsunami was real. It was what forced us to take emergency shelter in the fade. You saw it with your own two eyes. The light in Apollo's eyes dwindled. I know. But look around you. It's all back. That means that they could be back too. He set off across the apartment floor. I'm coming with you, Klaus shouted, trailing behind him. The others followed. The door leading from inside the apartment to the hallway where they could access the stairwell was closed. Apollo tried to reach for the handle, but was sent to the floor with piercing pain radiating down his back leg. It was an injury from tumbling backwards in the wind that he hadn't realized was that bad until now. Klaus had the idea to use moonlight to cut a hole in the door, but when he drew the blade from the sheath, the blue flame flickered and dimmed until it was no more. It needs time, Artemis said. You used all of its stored energy fending off the wind and getting us in and out of the fade. Thank the gods, it didn't run out while we were still in there. How do you charge it? It just needs time under the moonlight, I'm guessing. That's how the other pendants work. Step aside, amigos. I've got this. Snickers stepped up to the door. He looked at the handle, and then back at the crook of his tail. Just like old times. With that, he flipped into the air, spinning back end up, and caught the handle with his tail hook. The door clicked open. The cat held his tail by one paw and blew at the tip like he'd seen cowboys do in movies when they had gunned down the bad guy. He wasn't rewarded with any Mr. Mitten's select chunky tuna reserve to fill his loneliness with this time. Instead, he was filled with purpose and the kinship he felt towards his new companions. They made their way down the stairs and out to the street. It was quiet. There were no sounds coming from anywhere in the town. No words being exchanged in the stores, or from down at Jasper's trading ground. Hello? Anybody? Can anyone hear me? Apollo was moving slower than he would have liked, so he sent his voice out as a scout. There was no response. They eagerly made their way down to the alley that led to the badger's hut. It too was still standing untouched, just as he'd left it. Despite the pain in his leg, Paulo ran to it. He threw the door open. Kids! Zora! Klaus and Snickers joined him in searching the home and the surrounding area. Like the rest of the town's inhabitants, the badgers had vanished. Defeated, Paulo slumped in the chair by the fireplace. He closed his eyes, picturing the last moment he saw his family. I should have stayed. I should have stayed with them. He pulled the belt with the pouches off from across his shoulder. With care, he opened one of the pouches, reached in and retrieved the necklace Zora had given him. He could still feel her energy surrounding it. Thank you. 
Snickers. Mijos. You need to remember, Artemis said. I believe that what's happening now is the work of Kronos. He knows you are free, and he will stop at nothing to get to you. You are at risk too, little one, she said, directing her attention to Klaus. He seeks the Zodiac Pendants. The world of mirror mist and moonlight is vast, with endless possibilities. If you enjoy the story and you want to see it grow, you can help the travelers and me by sharing, liking, and subscribing. Thank you.